Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another session of Sound Bites for Immigration Success. We're so happy to have you with us today. We do this podcast series so you can get to know your fellow colleagues, hear their story, successes and challenges, and uh, hear their final takeaway tips. I am so excited to have with us today, Candy Hui. Hi, Candy. How are you? I'm great. Hi, Monica. How are you doing? I'm good. It's uh, lovely to have you with us today. Candy, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you decided to become an immigration consultant. Um, You're quite unique in that you're pursuing two quite distinct careers uh, at the same time. So share us a little bit of your story. Okay, before we start, I'd like to do my land acknowledgement, Monica. So I, Candy Hoy, acknowledge that I live and work on Treaty 4 land with a presence in Treaty 6. These are the territories of the Nahiawak, Anishinaabek, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Mischief Nation. So as Monica, you mentioned, I have two professions. Um, I'm a licensed pharmacist, um, and I have officially become a licensed pharmacist for 10 years. I just had my 10-year reunion, um, so... <laughs> And then my second profession is, I'm sure everyone knows why I'm on the podcast, is because I'm a licensed immigration consultant. Um, Both hats, I think there is intersection um, in the fact that we are here to assist our patients or our clients. So patients in healthcare, clients in immigration. Um, And also when I learned about medical admissibility, that was when it really piqued my interest because I feel like I can have a unique perspective in that case. And also um, another common factor between the two professions is that you really need to be meticulous. Um, In immigration, we have to be very detail oriented in the fact because it's literally someone's life on hold, right? They could be, you know, if we have a incomplete R10 rejection, then, then their life was on hold for couple months, right? And that's really impactful. Um, Same thing in pharmacy, um, medical field. Um, You know, I need to be careful in what I dispense. I need to make sure there are no drug-drug interactions, drug-food interactions, kidney-liver function. So I feel that the two professions um, have come and collided. And and I fell in love with immigration probably um, after I started really knowing what it was. Because unlike a lot of our colleagues, I didn't have that live-in experience immigrating. I came here as a child with my family, so I didn't really have that experience, um, which which a lot of our colleagues do have, and that gives them a very unique perspective and and love for immigration. And I totally respect that. But I didn't come from that. I, I, I went in kind of blind, not knowing what really immigration was in general. So um, how I came and stumbled upon it was really my friends kind of pushed me to take the the English test saying that you know Candy you're the only one that could probably hit a CLB9 and so I went in did it didn't think much about it I I was very calm I it was it was an experience to me I just took it as an experience to just see what it may take me um, so I went in and thankfully after one test, I did get the results I required to be applied to UBC. Um, so I got in and then I started learning immigration, um, what it was about, the history, the charters of rights. It got me kind of outside of my comfort zone, I would say, because my comfort zone is healthcare. Um, you know, it's very different. Um, immigration is very worldly. You need to look at everything in a very worldly perspective. Immigrant um, pharmacy, I, I focus on patients. They are a whole as a patient, but I don't necessarily need to think of it, you know, what's going on, you know, politically or things like that. I didn't ever have to do all those political things. Um, and now I do. And it, so it opened up doors for me. And I, I am thankful to have found such a, um, important role. Um, I, I feel that we are important um, in immigration. Um, in all honesty, both the reason I have passion for both of my careers and profession is because both of them give me a sense of I'm assisting someone, I have a purpose, um, I'm doing something that I'm grateful that I have a chance to do. I'm just really grateful. Yeah, I was thinking about this. I was like, um, I posted on my Twitter the other day that like I was thankful to be a pharmacist and have a purpose. But at the same time, I'm also thankful because I do have a purpose in immigration as well. And I'm thankful to have had 
um, such a great start to my career in, in, in immigration um, because I have a lot of support in both in, in re regulated immigration consultants and also um, with immigration lawyers. So I, I find that I well supported. Um, I've, I've luckily have um, people that respect me in all levels. I've never had to fight for it. I know that there's sometimes butting of heads. It's kind of like butting of heads with doctors <laughs> as a pharmacist. You have different opinions on things. Um, but at the end of the day, I feel that it, all, it comes down to one rule. We need to respect each other. And if you respect what you do, you respect yourself, you respect others, you respect the rules of the game, you are going to um, you have good things happen to you. That's just the one rule that we just need to live with. <laughs> Candy, thank you for sharing uh, your story and your passion for both your professions. And a lot of words resonated with me there from respect to passion, to joy, to gratitude to helping others. And um, you're not alone in terms of the immigration consulting, why so many have entered the profession. I would say almost everyone that I've spoken to on this podcast series have said that being an immigration consultant has brought them great joy and great reward, and that they're so happy to have um, helped someone, you know, come to Canada. And as an extension of that, sort of help build Canada, you know, in some small way, uh, so thank you for that. And thank you for, um, you know, sharing the similarities in, to some degree between both your professions. Uh, I like the fact that you you dispense drugs and you dispense information and you have to be so careful when you do that. It has to be accurate, honest, ethical information because it can impact the lives of your patient and your client. So now that you're here, um, I'd like to go to the next question. And the next question is, is for you, uh, what has been your biggest challenge as as an immigration professional, and how are you tackling it? As an immigration consultant, the biggest tackle was probably being brave enough to hit my first submission button, <laughs> because it's scary, right? Being the first time, being someone's representative, um, knowing that sometimes things are completely out of your hand, you've done your best but the results are not within your control, right? Um, so that's really scary. Um, the biggest hurdle I find for myself in general is finding maybe the time because we only have 24 hours in a day and I am juggling multiple hats, a mother of two, pharmacist and a licensed consultant. Oh, and I'm also a wife and daughter, right? <laughs> um, so, so there are lots of hats to juggle, but the busier I am, the more happy I am. I think it's because it's almost like I I have a purpose and a calling almost that I, I feel makes me enjoy my life more. It brings me joy to, to have that purpose. Um, Challenge-wise, I think one of the biggest is also, you know, when, when you have clients that you really want to help really, really want to help, but there's just no option. And you have to tell them the truth. There is no option. There's there's, you know, you've exhausted every option and there isn't another pathway, right? Like when you hear people, you know, I've, I've tried to get my permit five, six times and I've been rejected multiple times, you know, it becomes like, you're their last chance and it's be stressful. It's very stressful, right? You're like, so I've got to throw everything in and be very, very strong in my application. And thankfully, um, many of them have turned around in my experience and career. And I'm thankful for that. Um, I'm still doing a tips to figure out what exactly is the magic formula. There is no magic formula. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's one thing you count on for sure in this, in this field. Uh, there is no magic formula because what worked one time might not work the sense. And I, I really liked what you said in terms of um, you have to be brave because you're given us such a huge responsibility when, when somebody's um, immigration life is in your hands, whether it means they can come to Canada to be able to support their family back home or they're needing to take, um, 
you know, a, a course that's going to bring them to the next step in their own career or whatever, whatever it might be. So um, I commend you in, in being brave and being responsible and um, in, in taking the plunge. You know, the old expression that they say, if you want to get something done, you contact somebody who's busy. So you said to yourself that keeping busy is, has, has brought you joy. Uh, and it's true. You know, when you wear a lot of different hats, you just find the time, but you have to take time for yourself. You were telling me um, a little bit before we became on air that you, you're really making a, at a point in your own life to be present in the moment, to disconnect a little bit. Talk, talk to that a little, a little bit for me. So um, when I first started my career, I um, started at hair and law office with Will Tao, who's one of the best preceptors I can ever hope for. And so our office uses MS Teams and Microsoft, you know, email, and I put them on my phone. <laughs> and so I was always like, oh, I got a message. I got a reply. I got to, you know, go, go, go. And I noticed that my my children were like calling me and I'd be completely out of the loop and playing with them, but I'm on my phone. So um, I decided in my last holiday here, just like two weeks ago, that I was going to delete Teams and delete the emails um, for the office on my phone and only keep my personal emails on my phone um, so that I can be like, okay, I'm working and I'm not working. And then obviously I always have my emergency. I always like give them my cell phone number. So if there's anything emergency they need me for, then by all means, give me a shout, give me a text, give me a call. Um, so it's not that I'm unreachable. It's just that um, I need to be there enjoying my children's childhood, which is why I became, you know, a very part-time pharmacist in the first place. I stepped down um, from being a full-time pharmacist working maybe, you know, in a row, I could work 10 days in a row, um, full-time eight hours to now I work about, about like 14, 15 hours a week um, pay cut. But, but it's because I do really want to enjoy being a mother to young children because I only have so much time with them before they kind of grow up and do their own thing and have their own friends. Um, sometimes it's hard though. Sometimes it's hard. It's like my two-year-old right now is everything mom, 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 mom. And you're like, oh, I just want to like do my own thing. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, I think as a parent, um, you know, it's something that you'll, it'll be with you all your life, even when they're 18 and out the door in college. But, and so you're, you're still squeezing your, your time for your, uh, your practice that you have within those, those 168 hours that are in a week. So this brings me to my last question, maybe my last question. What advice would you give to somebody who's graduating today and just starting, just starting out, maybe, maybe they getting ready to write their licensing exam or they've just written it and they're sort of figuring out pathways. What would be your advice to them? I would say create a network of support um let it be your school friends colleagues um preceptors I was lucky like I said um, I started my career off at Heron Law and so Will was kind of like the unspoken mentor preceptor I had from the beginning um and that that was actually a, one month after I got my license I began I began my work at Heron so to me I think that was the best decision that I ever made was to reach out to my professor at UBC and be like, I just passed my exam. You know, do you think that I could, you know, be under your wing? Um, and and Will is really great. He lets me do my own thing. So I still have my own, I own have I'm my own company and I can take my own clients. And he, you know, when I say like I take my own clients and I have questions, I can go to him, give him a call, and we'll have a call about my questions. Um, and then I work for him as kind of like a case manager. Um, he trusts me. I, I believe he trusts me a lot <laughs> um, where I, I I pretty much get to run with the case myself. I get to, um, as a contractor to Heron, I get to choose the cases that I want. So I do more complex cases that I find that I am um, feeling uh, more fulfilled with. Um, 
because I have such limited time, I I want to do cases that are more complex. So I take most of my time doing um, humanitarian compassion, um, doing ones that are like straightforward. So like people that have been refused four or five times, trying to turn that around. Um, and my favorite is family sponsorships. I just I just love the feeling of getting you know the family together, um, especially now that I have my own family and like it is just it it makes me very happy. And I'm very grateful to have my parents here. And so I just know how important it is to have your, your parents here, especially when you have um, young children. Um, like the reason I can sit here uninterrupted, Monica, today is because my parents are out there being my childcare um, so that my young can, you know, have her lunch, you know, go for a nap. And I can I can sit here and do, do what I love either way, right? Um, so... I love family sponsorship. I love complex cases. And Will has allowed me to do a lot of academia stuff. So um, I've been, you know, been able to do presentations for KPIC, which is, I, I think, like, I would have never <laughs> been able to um, at so early in my career. Um, and then um, I've done your universe, Cornell, we've done one, Waterloo. Um, so I'm thankful for, you know, this the pre the mentorship that I have received, even from you, Monica, you know, being able to chat with you once in a while, seeing you on email threads that we have in our peer help group, um, knowing that I have a strong support system and that it would be the advice for myself is build that system, build that system early. Um, you know, it's okay to not be profitable maybe for the first little while while you learn co-counsel, like we say that, like, <laughs> like a broken record, right? Co-counsel, co-counsel and, and give your co-counsel the, you know, the, the reimbursement that they deserve, right? Like, um, don't, don't just take and not give, right? Um, I work for Will, he asks me to do certain things, right? I work for him. So then he mentors me in my, my own cases. Um, so it's a two-way street, right? Mentorship is a two-way street. If you're the only, you know, you just want someone to give, 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 eventually they're going to resent you and then you're not going to have a good reputation. You only get one chance at a reputation, right? You can't, you can't be unethical and then think you can erase it and then like you can start all over, right? You can't, right? Like life isn't like that. So um, one advice that I get when I was in, pharmacy school because there's it's always changing it's a very great area um sometimes the right decision for one patient could be wrong for the next but at the end of the day are you in, doing everything in your control best interest of your client or patient would you be comfortable having your mom or grandma seeing your decision and your actions on like the front page of google <laughs> right think about those right um don't take any shortcuts. There are no shortcuts to success. I'm not saying that I'm successful. I'm definitely not. There's so much I still need to learn from everyone, including Monica. Like, wow, running KPIC, I, I don't know how you guys do it. <laughs> um, so, and then, yeah. So in the end of the day, do what you think you can live with. Think, Do what you think you can live with. Make those decisions that are hard. Is it going to be that Mm, I can't I I don't like for myself I have a weak heart I have made a decision a conscious decision not to do refugee cases but I will do humanitarian compassion cases my heart just cannot take that pain I'm very empathetic so I would literally probably cry with my refugee client and that's not professional and that's not the type of counsel they need necessarily on their side to give them the advice with a clear head. I just don't think that I have the ability to do that. Same reason why I chose to be a pharmacist and not a doctor. I don't think I can diet, like give a, you know, a death sentence, right? A diagnosis that, you know, you're going to die in the next three months. Like, I'm sorry, right? Like, but I'm okay being a pharmacist and dealing with the aftermath and helping them maneuver their palliative care, their, you know, their spouse's palliative care. Um, so same thing. Um, I just make conscious decisions on what you can handle. Um, you don't want to make yourself too tired, right? Like you don't want to 
um, you know, go home and be like really sad all the time. And I think that that's what would happen to me if I took on those really hard refugee cases. And that's why I have complete respect for people that have such a strong heart and are willing to assist those people. I just, I know that I, I wouldn't be their best decision, knowing you're not the best decision and, and refer them right? That, that may be the best decision for your client. Do the best thing for them. Best thing for yourself, but best thing for your client, right? That's the ethics of our profession, doing the best that we can. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, excellent, excellent advice and takeaways from, from creating a network and reaching out and not be afraid to reach out to advocate for yourself and, you know, and not just assume that, the mentorship is going to come. You have to ask us, you have to ask. And the worst somebody can say is no. And, um, you know, I like what you said about um, sometimes you have to make yourself uncomfortable and you have to ask the hard questions, including yourself. Am I capable of doing this? Can I do this? Am I representing the client to the best of my ability? Um, would my mother or grandmother want to be proud of me? Would they, or would they question what I'm doing? That's a great uh, line in the sand. If you're not sure of your own line, think of think of somebody who um, you want to make proud. And um, at the end of the day, you have to uh, be responsible to yourself and your clients and and uh, make the right decisions, the decisions that count. Well, Candy, thank you very much. I really enjoyed our conversation. I really enjoyed your honesty. Um, and by the way, it's uh, it, there's a huge team at Capic, uh uh, and, you know, it's uh, something that it's really our members. It's for the members, by the members. And I know you're a CAPIC member and we appreciate your contribution. Um, so, uh, you know, we we can't be who we are with without, um, without our members. And really, it's a collective. You know, I, I, I hear what you said about um, respect yourself, respect the rules and respect each other. If we can all do that, I think um, I think the world or maybe the profession would be a, a little bit of a better place and hopefully we're, we're getting there. So thank you, Candy. Thank you, Monica. Thank you everyone. Yes. Thank you. Thank everyone you. At yes. Thank you all. Thank you all for listening and we'll see you at the next one.